Welcome to the C Word, the Conservatives podcast. Today we're talking about parenthood. I'm Jenny Mathiason, an object conservator based in South Yorkshire. I'm Chloe Rumsey, an objects conservator based in Greater Manchester. And I'm Christina Rizek, an objects conservator based in Cambridgeshire. Welcome back. Hi. Right, so I originally named this maternity and then people got cranky at me. <laughs> so we renamed it Parenthood because to be fair, we are also talking about dads. Well, so I think um, maternity to me suggests just the antenatal period and the sort of perinatal period, if you like, the period immediately around having... Yeah, no, the, that's true. Um, I suppose yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, yeah, parenthood, it, depending on how many children you have and at what intervals parenthood could carry on for kind of like 20 years yeah yeah, yeah actually it normally does <laughs> i was i honestly just thought oh yeah gender rights definitely and that's actually that's a yeah, super solid reason as yeah well. no that is a good reason yeah because i went at this with like my feminist like horns on like oh my god we're like mostly women and we're oppressing ourselves by not looking after ourselves and being really mean when we become mothers which is a weird thing which is part of what i want to talk about today actually but yeah we'll talk a bit about dads as well so please don't feel left out guys you also get a mention so it's all cool it's all cool um yeah so i can't remember which of you came up with the idea for this topic i think it's my fault i think it's jenny all right but i'd be really interested to know why you hit on it as an idea well i guess it's because you know i watched other people in conservation become mothers because i mean even at university we weren't all the same age right Some were mothers already, some were about to become mothers, and it was a kind of a interesting journey to watch other people go through this and having these, not necessarily problems, but having some challenges sometimes of their employers and sometimes getting back into conservation after having kids. And I just felt like, for God's sake, if most of the workforce is female, why the hell are we so hard on women Mm. who go away and have kids? That's pretty normal and it's normal for society. Why are we making it really weird and awkward? And yeah, it it upset me and it's always been a niggling thing. Why? Why are we not better at this? It's weird. So I just kind of wanted to put it out there. And especially since I feel like a lot of conservatives kind of feel like it's a slightly taboo subject. You can't talk about kids, can you? Well, yeah, you can. (laughs) Out of the three of us, maybe we should kind of explain where we fit into this. Right, I suppose I'll go first. So I do not have children. I am of childbearing age. I would quite like children. And it's something that we're starting to look at because you know what? I'm in my 30s. I'm not getting any younger. (laughs) And also I have polycystic ovary syndrome, which is something that affects about one in 10 women. And in my case will probably mean that I need a little bit of help getting pregnant and stuff. So this is something that's on my mind quite a bit, actually, because we're trying to plan a family and that's a slightly weird journey in and of itself and because it's probably going to take some help and stuff it's kind of a long journey so i'm thinking about it a lot basically our time yeah and how do you see your work fitting in with that or having an impact on that well i suppose at the moment i'm very lucky i'm in a, a permanent position at the moment i would be in a position where i would be able to have maternity leave which is nice and is not something that has previously been the case, I would argue. But it's worth mentioning that I work in an organization where maternity covers don't exist. They do not replace people. So it's seen as a saving. Basically, they will be without a conservator for a considerable amount of time. How that fits in with my work, we'll um, we'll probably uh, have to wait and see. We'll see. (laughs) Yeah, we'll see how that goes. But, you know, it's something that's on the cards but it's a long journey. So, it, you know, it ultimately might never happen. I mean, that could be the case. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if, if it's even possible, but I want to. And that's that's a well, thing. Try. Yeah, that's a thing. That's where I'm at. So I'm, I'm of childbearing age, which is, I feel like a really weird phrase seeing as I've been that age since I was like, yeah, right. technically, <laughs> yeah. technically 16. Yeah. And oh no, was I <laughs> childbearing. Yeah, anyway, so I'm not quite 30. <laughs> so I feel like I still have time to be as totally unemotionally prepared <laughs> as I still am. Uh, but in terms of professionalism and my, my career and stuff, rather than going into my uh, <laughs> terror and still feeling like I'm a 15 year old, um, <laughs> I have been very hyper aware of 
the challenges that women face in conservation from a emerging professional point of view. And I've encountered female colleagues in the past who have been really keen to have kids, really wanted to have kids, but they haven't been able to because they've been on temporary contracts and they've been waiting to be made permanent or they've been waiting to find a permanent job in order to feel able that they can have kids. And I I hadn't really considered that to begin with at all because, you know, you don't when you're 22 or whatever. And I was horrified by the idea that you could, some such an important and valuable decision could be affected by essentially the museum sphere having no funding and it, that's just a really that's just a really sorry state of affairs personally i would like to have kids i think but probably not for a couple of years <laughs> at least um i'm really enjoying my job so i don't really want to sort of think about having a break from that at the moment for, for the record chloe is currently looking absolutely terrified <laughs> So, okay. Uh, okay. Okay. I could barely look after my cats or <laughs> myself for that matter. It's, like, it's okay, you're in a safe space. You're in a safe space. But it's it's young women know this. It's always on your mind. If you unless you have decided, unless you've either discovered that you can't have kids and you've made your peace with that, or you've decided that you definitely don't want to have kids, it's it's always going to be on your mind because it's kind of this looming possibility. And there's you know, so society tells you you should. You either want to, you don't want to, or are undecided. And it's a topic that we just don't really, you you know, it is a personal topic. So, you know, it should be dealt with sensitivity. But also, if we kind of squirrel it away and hold the anxiety inside, it's not going to get better. We're not going to make any changes. We're not going to address it formally with our management teams. So it's just going to go unsolved. And then people um, just feel alone and that's just sad. So Exactly. We're going to we're going to talk about it today and we're going to read out some listener stories and stuff and yeah, we're just going to have a little talk about it. Exactly. And we're going to drag it out of the shadows and be like this isn't taboo. It's okay to talk about it. How- so Christina, how about you? The intake well, of breath. The- <laughs> of- well, <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> of the people who have kids. I have two children who are in years one and three at school. That means they're five and seven, nearly eight. Thank you, I needed that. don't have kids and don't know what school year is, a quick tip. I didn't have children until I was 34. So now you can work out how old I am. And I was on a temporary contract when I decided to have my first child. It was a two-year contract that subsequently got extended by three months. I guess I did wait until the last year <laughs> that contract was in sight before deciding to start trying to get pregnant. As it happens, I I got pregnant quite quickly. My due date was four days before the end of my contract extension. Oh my God. So kind of good timing in that respect. Uh, so my son was due on the 1st of January. My contract ended on the 5th of January. Wow. As it further happens, my <laughs> son was born a month prematurely. Oh, so gosh. he actually arrived in December. I had assumed I wasn't going to get maternity pay what with my contract end basically coinciding with the birth of the baby Mm. as it happens and this is why I wanted to mention this because I think this is a really common misconception that if you're on a short-term contract you're not going to get any maternity pay and that is just not true for a start there are two things there is statutory maternity pay and there is maternity allowance both of which are paid by the government and I don't know how much it is now but when I when I had my children it was about 130 pounds a week something like that so it's not a huge amount of money compared with working, but it's all right. You know, it's it's 500 quid yeah. a month, something mm. like that, 600 quid a month, maybe. And so it's enough to keep things ticking over. On top of that, many people get contractual maternity pay. That means that their employer might be more generous than just the statutory minimum. And um, in my case, I was working for a university museum. And so I was eligible for the university's uh, maternity scheme. However, the important thing here is what they call the qualifying week. That's the 15th week before the expected week of childbirth. So basically when you're like 25, 26 weeks pregnant, something like that. And you have to be employed by them in the qualifying week to be entitled to statutory maternity pay. Mm. And you have to give them proof that you're pregnant, which means you have to get a form signed by a midwife. Even if you've got an enormous stomach by this point, you still have to do it. And the midwife just say, yes, yes. This woman is pregnant and is due to give birth on this date. And then they can work it out where you were you employed 15 
weeks before that date, yes. You also have to have been continuously employed by them for at least 26 weeks before that qualifying week. Yeah. So basically from the week before you conceived. <laughs> Not to get too it's really kind of personal. About it. Yeah, so it is a bit. If you're thinking about yeah, well, I actually met those criteria. I was employed by them when I was 26 weeks pregnant and I had been employed by them for 18 months, 2 years before that as well. So I was entitled to maternity pay. And the weird thing was obviously my contract ended when my son was a month old, but I carried on getting maternity pay from mm-hmm. my employer. Wow. Um, through payroll as normal after that. The other misconception is that employers are really badly served by employees who go on maternity leave. But this statutory maternity pay, the £130 a week, as I said, and that's the bare minimum that they have to pay you if you qualify mm-hmm. for it. It's actually 145 now. Oh, OK. 145. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Um, <laughs> obviously, employees can decide to offer you more than that if they want, if they think this is a, an incentive you know, or makes them more attractive as an employer, they can reclaim 92% of the SMP, the statutory maternity pay amount, from the government. So that 145 quid, they get back 92% of it and they only pay, I don't know, however much is left, um, 15 quid or something per week. So really, the cost to them is very small. Yeah. Financially, the cost of not having an employee for nine months or a year it's potentially more serious and a lot of employers decide not to recruit anybody to cover that and that's where the inconvenience comes in but obviously that's a decision they've taken it's not inevitable Mm -hmm. and it's not that they're going to have to be paying two sets of salaries at the same time that's just not true Mm. so after that I as I said my contract ended I didn't have a job to go to (laughs) I wasn't intending I didn't really have any particular plans I kept a vague eye out for jobs to see what was around and then a job came up editing a journal which was supposedly two days a week although actually it turned out to be a lot more onerous than that um, (laughs) could be done largely from home and I'd already done quite a lot of editorial work before that so I applied for that job and got it and thought whoopee I can work from home that'll be dead easy with a baby around Um, (laughs) which it wasn't (laughs) simultaneously my son was diagnosed with a very serious medical condition Mm. Um, and required a lot of hospital treatment. And also I applied for and was accepted onto a PhD course starting when he was nine months old. Yeah, so um, when he was nine months old, he was having a lot of inpatient treatment in hospital. And I was supposedly doing a PhD and also trying to work part-time and I hadn't really got adequate childcare and stuff. So it was all a bit of a nightmare. And I think this is partly because I was in denial about how much my life was going to change Mm -hmm. as a result of this. And I thought, I'm just going to power ahead with all my plans. These are the plans I had before. This is not going to change anything. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. of course, it all came kind of crashing down and became immensely stressful and difficult Mm -hmm. I wouldn't really recommend that (laughs) and I subsequently ended up putting the PhD on hiatus and later on actually just binning it completely although it's something I hope to go back to at a point when my life is a bit calmer (laughs) Um, I then got a job in a museum which was advertised as a full-time job And I had a very close friend and ex-colleague, Sophie Rowe, whom I'm going to be interviewing later in this episode, who also had children. And we were both looking for part-time jobs at the time, and there weren't any. And we said, you know what, let's just apply for this job as a job share. It's crazy, but you never know, it might work. That's and such a good idea. They it is a great idea. took our application seriously. We got invited to interview. We went to interview together. And I tell you what, it is really weird having a job interview with another person. Anyway, they offered us a job, amazingly, as a That's job so share. Good. And we, we made a case, really, for this being an advantage to them Mm. that between us we had 25 years of conservation experience between us and the fact that we didn't have to take holiday at the same time so there was potentially always a conservator in the museum part-time there wouldn't be periods where there was nobody there Mm. and the fact that we had kind of quite complementary skills and experience and so on so we kind of made a case for this they accepted it and we did that so I did that for four years I then had another child in 2013 so she was born while I was actually employed on a contract and this time I just thought you know what I'm not gonna let my work circumstances dictate my private life I I think something really changes after you've had the first child because you've completely 
reorganised your life anyway. <laughs> You've just kind of torn everything up and thrown it in the air and seen where the pieces land. And so I felt a lot less inclined to go along with what was convenient for my employer at the expense yeah. at my expense actually and so I just thought yeah we want to have another child now now is a good time for us we're going to do it and so I did and so that time I was employed and, and I took nine months off work and then came back and had a job to come back to this time so quite a different kind of experience mm-hmm. I will say I found it very difficult coming back to work I suffered quite a lot of anxiety about my skills and um, knowledge oh, no. and whether they would have atrophied in the meantime I think you, you a lot of women have quite a crisis of confidence coming back um, my job was covered and so then you have this terrible fear that they're going to prefer your maternity cover to you and not want you to come back and want to keep the maternity cover instead and you know that's it's, illegal it's, though isn't it, it can be very very difficult emotionally is that illegal? Uh, yeah, though? it is, but it doesn't mean that you don't think your colleagues will want that. I mean, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like literally, that your colleagues will think, "Oh God, so and so is much better at this job than Christina mm-hmm. was." Let's. Oh God, I wish we could keep her. You know. So to cut a long story short, I have been working ever since, mostly part time, but with periods of full time work. I've I haven't had a permanent job. I've had lots of short term contracts. I've had uh, at times a piecemeal of short-term contract and other bits of work around the side, a little, f- a few freelance jobs and so on. So it's really been a kind of mixture of things, whatever I can manage to make work for our family. Mm-hmm, there was yeah. also a period where I just couldn't find conservation work and I wasn't mobile. And so I got yeah. a non-conservation job for 18 months part-time. And I did that three days a week, really, to pay the bills and did whatever I could around that to keep my conservation career going until another conservation contract came up a year ago mm. and I went back to museum work. My current contract's going to end yeah. in a couple of months in November and I don't know what I'm going to do after that. I haven't seen any likely jobs advertised locally Mm. and I'm not very mobile for various reasons Um, I can no longer really commute long distances for work so again I'm going to have to make that decision about what I do really Um, do you know what you want to do has this been has this period of um, the part-time conservation job been good for you been good for your life or is it something you need to change I think I am possibly reaching a point where I would rather have stability than an exciting conservation job. Right. That's really sad, isn't it? But no, it's there's not a point sad. where no, it's, it's also very you've common. You've been on <laughs> part-time contracts for nearly 15 years. I mean, not yeah. part-time. I've been on temporary contracts for nearly 15 years and for whatever reason I haven't found a full-time uh, I haven't found a permanent job and I need some stability. I need to be able to plan childcare. I don't even mm-hmm. know yeah. what days I should be booking after school club, for example. I mean, it sounds like such a small thing, but it's not. And really with children, it's, it's so much easier with some degree of predictability and stability. Um, I'm also finding it harder and harder, I have to say, the, the kind of emotional toll of constantly knowing you're going to be made redundant again and having to find another job and scrabbling around for work and because of this never really feeling like you're making progression in your career and feeling that you're not that you're constantly at the same level I I feel I'm sort of competing with people graduating 10 years after me people who are more mobile people who are younger and don't have children people you know it sort of in some ways feels as if it's getting harder and harder and I think in the next five years I'm going to have to make a decision about what I do is there something to be said uh, you've worked um freelance for for a bit haven't you Mm. um is there a way that that could work for you possibly and I have done some work um, recently for a museum through a temporary employment agency which allowed me to work there just one day a week upgrading their storage Mm -hmm. for them and that worked quite well it was quite a short-term contract I was taken on as a temp so I filled in a timesheet every week and was paid for the number of hours that I'd done that week so there was you know there was quite a lot of flexibility there if Mm -hmm. I had to leave early they were happy for me to do that because they weren't paying me for the hours that I wasn't working so if I needed to leave at lunchtime to go and do something at school or whatever then that was fine it was only I I was only (laughs) losing money myself if you see what I mean Um, and that worked quite well and I'd I'd quite like to do that kind of thing again private work I think would be difficult because there's often a huge initial investment required 
in terms of premises yes and equipment and things like insurance and so on so there's quite a lot of a gamble there and i think unless you are reasonably confident that you're going to get quite a lot of work <laughs> coming your way then yeah. i think that feels quite like a risky indulgence I also think it's quite it's harder in some types of conservation than others. And I'm an objects conservator. Mm-hmm. And I'm an objects conservator who's had a lot of experience on very museum-y kind of objects, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, yeah. I, so no, <laughs> I, I've enough. considered that, but I, it feels like quite a big step to take. I think it's the kind of thing I would consider actually in partnership with somebody else, where you could spread the initial investment and spread the risk and so on. Um, so yeah. if there's any other mums in the Cambridgeshire area <laughs> or dads, <laughs> uh, who want to come and start a private business with me, let me know. To be fair, that does sound jolly fun. That sounds really fun. Uh, I thought I'd, <laughs> I'd bring it back to some of the reasons that I thought this was, was an important topic. There was a recent BBC article that said that working mums are up 50% since the 1970s. Wow. It's now a very common occurrence for obvious reasons. Yet 77% of all women who are working as they're pregnant or who are new mums feel discriminated at work and 77 wow. is a really high that's number really, really obviously high that's number. across all sectors so that's like another reason why this is can be quite an important topic to tackle mm-hmm. really i don't know if i ever felt overtly discriminated against but i think there are times when the expectations that museums sometimes have of their employees can be difficult to fulfill if you're a parent so uh, we were chatting about this earlier. I'm I'm currently working on a exhibition that's slightly mad and is um we we we've got a huge loan and I've basically been at work really late every evening this week and I went in yesterday which was a Saturday and so on in order to get this done. In the normal course of things that would be absolutely impossible for me and I think I would be viewed quite negatively for being unable to do that if my colleagues were also putting in that kind of extra effort. As it happens, it's the tail end of the school holidays and my kids happen to be staying with grandparents that week, so that worked really well for me. But I think there are there are times when museums expect their employees to be able to drop everything and just change their plans at very short notice or stay late to get an exhibition installed or go on courier trips for very long times and all the kind of things that can be difficult for parents, especially parents with small children. I would like to say, actually, um, I've got something written down about this. I, for an exhibition recently, was working with a lot of people who didn't have kids, apart from one person who did have a child. And the attitude that the different people had, I found really, really interesting. So obviously, the woman with a child needed to leave at a certain time, because otherwise she would not be able to pick up her child. Yeah, of course. But the people without children would it would be sort of it was like the 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 time scales changed and the 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 concept of keeping to a deadline um, was altered slightly. So the idea of staying till one in the morning because you needed to do X, Y or whatever. (laughs) was sort of well we've just got to do it we've got to do it because we're really stressed but actually it occurred to me that it's extremely valuable but apart from obviously everyone should have equal opportunities it's extremely valuable i think to have people with children in a team because your perspectives are just different you've you've not it's not your whole life isn't just that exhibition you've got an actual like actual home life and I think that's a really healthy attitude and it's really healthy to have someone saying actually no five o'clock is home time this is the schedule that I keep and I have to keep it for this reason um and at, at, at often times during this exhibition install you know we'd be saying look we ha- we're going to go home at this time. If we had kids, we would have had to go home half an hour ago. And the only reason we st- we can stay around here is because we don't have children. This isn't on. So, I, you know, but I yeah. think it's a health. And it, obviously, you've, you have had to do overtime and it has been very difficult. But, you know, the fact that you have the perspective of this isn't life or death here. Let's let's be a slightly more relaxed about it. You know, it, I think it's universal, that anxiety that, oh, I'm not pulling my weight because I'm not doing the absolute physical most that I can. And I'm sure, you know, people without kids will be more understanding because they think I'm tired enough as it is. I can't imagine having to leave now and pick up, you know, two children and then do it's their It's interesting lives. you say that because that's very much not my impression. I think often that other side of my life is quite invisible 
to my colleagues. I'm the only person in my immediate sort of working environment who has children. And for most of my career, I think I've been working with other people who also don't have children. And in fact, just sort of before we started recording this, I did a bit of totting up. So I work for a group of museums. I work in one of a group of museums and I did some sort of back of the envelope calculations. I think in our group of museums, there are 16 conservators of whom three have children. And if you count research institute that's also associated with the museums as well, there's another eight people there, three of whom to have children, which is quite a lot. Two of them men, make that what you will. So it's either three out of 16 or six out of 24, 25% at most, probably less than 20%. Oh, and oh, I, oh, I want to join in the statistics. It's <laughs> atypical. Go on, do it. Because oh, I, I was also morbidly curious about this. So I started chatting up. Yay. Uh, <laughs> first of all, like my network of heritage people, mm-hmm. of which most are conservators. And uh, to my dismay, only about 35% of them were parents. Oh, wow. Um, but and most of those are women. And actually, the majority of the men don't have children, which mm-hmm. is interesting. Mm. Um, but also, another interesting thing was I then started thinking about my place of work, where 56% of, of the people have children. Oh, right. So actually, we're nearly 50-50 balance mm-hmm. of people who have and who don't have children, which possibly colours my perception of now feeling like I'm I'm in a job where it's not necessarily encouraged to have children. I would certainly not say that, but it also wouldn't be a black mark against you. Mm-hmm. It would be a fairly normal thing. Um, which Yet that, yeah. that 56% is still less than the average in the country. So I spent a happy half hour browsing on the Office for National Statistics website. <laughs> <laughs> and 20% of women born in, the 19, in 1971 are childless. So okay. women who are currently right. in their late forties and can be presumed to be past the age of childbearing, most of them. Um, so it's it's it, you would expect that out of all women, twenty percent would have no children, eighty percent would have one or more children. Mm, that so that's that's the kind of overall background. Obviously, that's in but all be- parts of the bearing country. Bearing in mind, yeah, bearing in mind yeah. that at my workplace, those women include people uh, who are apprentices and like mm-hmm. very so early on assistants. So like stage. you, you yeah, wouldn't necessarily sure. expect them to have children yet. Uh, if you see what I mean. So it's quite possible, that actually, that those people, if you, if you count all of them, that eventually it would reach that 80%. I oh. think that's quite unusual for a museum, Jenny. Yeah, I, I think it probably is. But I just wanted to kind of turn it on its head and say, mm. that, well, I actually work somewhere where has, well, which has a, yeah. a more even spread. I did do a Twitter poll on our uh, Twitter page a while ago and asked how many people were parents. And uh, 72% of the people who replied to that poll said they weren't. So that's still a, a very low amount of parents mm, in like mm-hmm. the people, at least mm-hmm. who follow us on Twitter, not necessarily people who listen. But mm-hmm. but yeah, so um, that's interesting as well. But yeah, so it is possibly a lot lower than you would expect, but I wouldn't say it's like completely unheard of. No, but I do think it is lower in museums than it is among the population as a whole i think it is oh i would agree based on those statistics people who have just not chosen not to have children for whatever reason Um, and and also that is because the average age of people having their first child women having their first child is creeping up all the time so it's just over 30 now okay Mm -hmm. or at least it is for people who will be 30 soon (laughs) and it's and also childlessness the rates of childlessness go up according to level of education so there's, a, yes. there's quite a strong correlation between level of education and rates of childlessness. The higher the level of education you have, the more likely you are not to have children, mm. if, if, at least for women. Yeah. And obviously conservation is rapidly becoming largely a postgraduate profession. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so you would expect as well there to be higher levels of childlessness among conservators than among the population as a whole. But I'm still surprised how low it is and I'd like to know why it is. People do reach conservation a lot later in life. Not everyone starts as an True. undergrad person in their early uh-huh. 20s. Because I remember like we, ha- we had a real spread up, up and well up until their probably 40s, mm. uh, at which point well, you might not look at having kids like mm. mm-hmm. just before menopause. You might not want that or mm-hmm. like it might not be a choice or, you know, there are also these sorts of reasons 
But since people come into conservation at all points in life, I think that might be an interesting additional complicating factor to this, actually, mm-hmm. uh, aside from the fact that it's uh, obviously uh, kind of a, a higher education type thing and, and statistical and all that. Mm-hmm. I do feel like I am more and more sort of erring towards thinking um, strategically about about when I would consider having a child, like considering who what what other people, other women in my department might be doing, and um, when if they would want to go on maternity leave, and okay, so I would go on maternity leave after that point, and oh, but this event is happening at this time, and this project is happening at this time, so kind of. So uh, I'm just going to say that that's an interesting thing that you might be thinking in those lines yeah. because pregnancy might not work that easily. Like, no, exactly. You, you might not be able yeah, to go, bang, let's do it now. Yeah, I know, and no. then, <laughs> no, that, that might not be how it works <laughs> at all. Well, exactly. But it's sort of, isn't how kind of, I do feel like the bit sort of the innocent 20 something year old that, that thinks, oh yeah, I'll just have to really plan everything really carefully. Completely contradicting what you said at the beginning of the episode, Christina. Like It just, <laughs> it just, happens and you've got to kind of just make it work the thing about it is that until you start trying to conceive you have no idea how easily that will happen or whether it will happen at all yeah it's just one of those unknowns and it's hugely variable between people and in a way it's not something you can plan that easily i mean it works out fine for some people but you just don't know until you start trying unfortunately no, you don't. And uh, even even when you start trying, and this is oversharing, but um, <laughs> but even when you start trying, it might be that you need help further, further along. But you still need to try for 18 months on the current rules of the NHS before you can have any kind of investigation done or oh, why, right. why you might not get pregnant. 18 months? Yeah, so you have to Wow, try that's a whole contract. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, so when you start planning... <laughs> that goes with you, was it 23, 23 weeks? <laughs> after your so, the start of your contract yeah. time oh, uh, and after that you're entitled you're kind of entitled to maybe one or two rounds of IVF oh or my something. god um and that sort of thing right uh-huh. uh, and after that you have to stop paying for it if you if you're really keen uh which is about five or six grand ago jesus christ so yeah <laughs> oh uh, just a, a, a vague technical detail before we embark on the next topic which is karen's interview i was just going to say we've already talked about how some of the ways that maternity pay or maternity allowance can work so i just thought i'd run through very briefly what maternity leave can work like in the uk mm-hmm. so you can take up to a year off as maternity leave but you can not take as little as two weeks <laughs> which is kind of fascinating to me you have to let your employer know at least... Uh, 50- which is all that you're allowed in the US. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. What? Well, yeah, because you're not really given paid maternity in the US. Two weeks? Yeah. What if you had a cesarean? Yep. Nope. They don't care. What are you supposed to do? But your not insides are nearly on the outside. <laughs> well, I don't understand. <laughs> you're going through major surgery. I don't understand. You uh, better have really good health insurance. King. That's what happens. Can yeah. our American friends, like, I mean, obviously this is a hugely personal ask, but if you've had experiences of this, American friends, let us know how that went. Because I'm, I'm genuinely, am I like the only person who doesn't know this? That's no, you're astonishing. Probably me. not the only one. The, but US is, the US is completely anomalous in this. Yeah. So the US is literally the only developed country with pretty much no paid maternity leave. Um, yeah. Jesus Christ. And, and other countries have much more generous policies than the UK. Sweden does, as Jenny will be able to confirm, I'm sure. Oh, yes. I have Sweden's maternity leave policy out in front of me. <laughs> she does. <laughs> just in case you ask. <laughs> it's immediately below the American one I've just noticed. No paid maternity at all. <laughs> Would you like to read it out and feel smug? <laughs> right. No, no, no. We're going we're gonna to keep going with the UK one. Sorry. Okay, so you can have as little as two weeks off. Uh, You have to let your employer know at least 15 weeks before the due date. And you can start your maternity leave 11 weeks before you're due. We've already talked about the different kinds of maternity pay. Uh, You can be paid for 39 weeks. Okay. The statutory maternity pay is 90% of your normal week earnings for six weeks. And then it's either 90% of your pay or £145 for the next 33 weeks, whichever is lower. There's also something called shared parental pay, which is the same and is then split between the parents, obviously. And maternity allowance can be as little as £27 per week. Jeez. Also, shared parental leave was uh, was only um, started in 2015, I think. So that's not been around for very long. Paternity leave is either one or two weeks. 
But you can use shared parental leave for up to 50 weeks, but only 37 weeks are paid. And then there's some additional guff about having had the same employer for a while, which we've already talked about. And also, if you don't return to your job and you got contractual maternity money, you might have to pay your employer back if you don't return to work. Say what? Yes, you might have to pay back money, which is great. So uh, tread carefully, people. So yeah, that's that's what that is. That's the nitty gritty of it. The UK is not doing badly. The UK is doing all right. Let's be fair. Uh That's all right. America. Well, yeah, quite. But (laughs) can that even get worse other than possibly being having to pay a fine? (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, now we've talked plenty about why people might want kids and that sort of thing. But Christina, you interviewed someone who definitely doesn't want kids, which is also a valid super valid yep. uh, thing uh-huh. thing to want and something that seems to be common amongst conservators although we can't verify that with any numbers but it might be yeah shall we listen to that now my name is karen horton i'm a independent textile and ethnographic conservator um, and i've been in the profession many years i trained as an archaeological conservator before i chose to specialize in textiles so this kind of follows on for a conversation we were having the other day anyway yeah. um, in our department. You don't have children. No. And that's by choice. Absolutely. And Anyone <laughs> who knows me will know it's certainly by choice. <laughs> and I was going to say it's quite a, a firmly held <laughs> yes, yes. choice as well, isn't yes. it? Do you want to say a bit about that? Um, people that know me are well aware that I don't like children. I dislike them. Um, I think it's because we work in a very controlled profession. You can't mm. control them. It's as simple as that, and I think that's why I don't like them. So, no, I've never had any maternal instincts or any desire at all. I think some of them are quite cute, but I'm very pleased they're not part of my life. That's obviously enabled you to develop quite a different kind of career, I think. Yeah, Yeah. so yeah, I work internationally. I have a very understanding partner, um, and we live very independent lives of each other anyway. He travels a lot, and so do I. Um, If I had children... I couldn't travel. I couldn't travel like I do. I have um, an elderly father now. So although I still travel, my travel has been curtailed a bit, or I do shorter shorter trips. I usually work um, for three months each year at the Institute of Archaeology in Shanxi, in Xi'an in China, conserving Ming Dynasty textiles. Um, And because of my father, I split it into two lots of six weeks now, not three months. Mm -hmm. However, having an elderly parent is different to having young children. And if I had children... I couldn't do this because there would be disruption to schooling, etc., etc. By not having children, it affords me my lifestyle to work internationally. And that, travel makes me tick. Everyone knows that. Has that always been yes. part of your yeah, career? I travel, even when I was training, Yeah, I used to go during term time on holiday at Christmas to Nepal. And that's why I chose not to have children from a very, very young age, because I wanted to travel. I certainly think, as a principally as a textile conservator, um, and because you know there's very few places to train, and I trained at the TCC, the training that we receive allow, affords us an opportunity to work anywhere in the world with our training. Yeah, I think that if you are if you are single or you have no commitments, um, you can go anywhere without the qualification. And I think that's the same as you know we both trained at UCL at the Institute of Archaeology. Yeah, um, and I think that's the same if you're an archaeological conservator or you want to work on excavation. I'm sure there are some people that manage to travel with children, etc., or have an extended family, that sort of thing. But no, I certainly could never have done it had I had children. I'm really interested in what you said at the beginning about having quite low tolerance for mess and disorder yes. and so on. Yes. And obviously children bring a lot of chaos to yes. people's Can't lives. Have that. I'm a true I am a true conservator in every sense. I yeah. absolutely like everything order. I'm the same at home. Everything is in order in its place. I like methodical. I do not like mess. And it's taken me a long time to realise that's probably re- the reason I don't like children is because you can't control the, their sound, their noise and their mess and they have to be children. Yeah. I'm very grateful for people having children, though, (laughs) as long as it's not me. But I was thinking, if I had had children, would I still be in conservation? Yeah. And no. Um, Because I live in central London, I would want my children to go to a private school. Yeah. And if I had to have children, I couldn't afford it on on a conservator's salary. Yes. So I would have had to have left the profession. And I only thought about that last night after our our conversation. Because... The pay 
It's never really gone up, has it? It's no. the same. 30 years on, everyone's still having the same conversation about the salary. And, you know, it's like 25,000 is a maximum yeah. you can get. Um, and most, and lots of places don't even achieve that. Yeah. And I feel quite strongly over it because um, we train for many, many years. Yeah. We get an object wrong, we can ruin it, you know. Um, and we should earn much higher salary. And if we did, then perhaps, you know, people wouldn't have to do have certain lifestyles or have a partner that earns yeah. considerably more than in them to, to, to help, you know, um, substitute it. I'm very lucky. My partner affords me my lifestyle. It's yeah. <laughs> not what I earn in conservation. It's because I have him and he is a major, you know, he's a major breadwinner. And if you had dependents, yes. that we couldn't, I couldn't do it. That no, yeah. but I feel very strongly. I think this needs to be looked at. You can earn more money it, with experience. You can become a conservation manager. But that's certainly not what I went into. I don't want to push bits of paper around or do people's, you know, <laughs> reviews. I want to work on objects. That's what makes me tick, you know. Mm-hmm. That's why I chose conservation and not curatorial work, because we have the privilege yeah. of being able to handle the objects and look at them in the most intimate detail. You were sort of saying about having the same sort of personality traits that makes you a conservative um, mm-hmm. in your private life mm-hmm. as well. And one thing that occurred to me is that some people who have children say they want children because they want part of them to persist into the future and it's this idea of carrying on things into the future Mm. that does actually kind of overlap with what we're aiming to do as conservators Mm. which is to preserve preserve objects so that they carry on into the future yeah but you don't you know you've never really felt Um, that personally um i do as i'm much older now i do have pangs um my mother was extremely disappointed I never had children. So there's a lot of that when you're very young, you know. Yeah. When you settle down, get a proper job and have children. Um, yes, I do think about there's nothing. I have no brothers and sisters. There is only me. So there is no legacy. And I think we want to mark... You do want to mark being on this planet somehow. So, um, well, I don't... Yeah, it's exactly. <laughs> the work you've done. It is, and it is the work that we do. And it is the conservation reports that we yeah. write. It's the papers that we give. Um, and it's the publications... And, and, of course, most people will think, oh, I'd like to write a book. And, of course, you know, you try, mm. but it's time, etc. you know, and um, there isn't always that. Re- Although a lot of our work, certainly in textiles and ethnography, is not physical, mm. mentally. It's, you can go home quite shattered. Yeah. Um, but I do think that it's, it's the work that we're doing, and because we're conserving it, that's the legacy mm. that we're leaving, rather than, you know, um, um, children or, or that sort of line. Um, had I decided to go down the children route, and I often talk about this with my partner, we would have adopted yeah. because um, I just think it's an ethical thing to do because there are so many children in this world that are unloved and need adoption. Um, and the bloodline means nothing to us at all. So, we, you know, we, did, we, we, we knew we never wanted it, neither of us, but we'd always said if we did, we would, have had, we would have adopted. So it's not an issue for us. But, yeah, I think it's important to mark that you're on this earth. And I like to think that my work has helped a bit. Karen Horton, thank you very much for talking to the C Word today. You're welcome. So, what did you think? Well, see, the thing is, I used to call myself child free, which is the really early 2000s way of saying childless by choice. Because uh, I used to be really hardcore against having biological children. Uh-huh. That used to be something that I, I did not want and I couldn't understand how people wanted mm-hmm. and I had a lot of very strong teenage opinions about it. <laughs> very strong. The kind strong. of opinions you have before you had to think about it. Uh, a little bit, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's not to say that it's not still a valid approach to life. Obviously it is. And at the time I thought I had really good reason. And I mean, I did have really good reason to think that. But, you know, sometimes you are allowed to change your opinion and that's fine. And that is what I've done. But I used to feel that way. So I, I can relate to a certain degree, as I'm sure loads of our listeners can. I think the thing I found fascinating was how Karen related her desire not to have children to the kind of personality traits that she felt made her a conservator. Oh, yes, that, that was, was kind really of fascinating. Dis- yeah. Disorder and chaos and her desire to control everything and to live in a very controlled environment. And obviously children are the complete antithesis of this. And I thought that was bold, really, to be so upfront about that. <laughs> yeah, I have to say, I and this is this is unrelated to children. This is actually related to pets. Um, but it's currently the only example I have. I have cats now who seem to me to be, for the most part, calm. They creep about. They might scratch things and knock things over, but, you know, 
know, the, the, they're quiet and calm about it. And quite often, since I moved into my new house, people with dogs have visited and dogs are not quiet. They're not calm. <laughs> they run around. They're chaotic. They're quite a lot like I imagine children to be, um, <laughs> as in loud and, and enthusiastic. They, enthusiastic and they make noise and they make mess and they knock things over. And I found myself kind of going, oh, God, <laughs> oh, God, can we just have some order? I can't. Ugh. So when she said that about being wanting to control situations and being, you know, orderly and let's not break things and stuff I absolutely felt where she was coming from but my hope is that I've kind of been clinging to the idea that if I was to have children I'd both be too busy keeping the creature alive uh, to worry (laughs) about it and also hoping that it would kind of ease me into the chaos like you know you've got a screaming thing to keep alive but at least it's not breaking things and then okay so it's starting to run around but it's not breaking too many things do you see what i mean is <laughs> that you not mean, the yes, introduction I do. to chaos I mean, is gradual to, yeah the translation of yes. pet analogy <laughs> <laughs> it's all i have okay christina <laughs> <laughs> to translate your pet analogy into child terms, I yes. would say that your cats sound more like your kind of six-month-old baby that's yes. not waking up all night and is generally quite happy and gurgly and smiley and so uh-huh. on. And occasionally dogs are scratchy. like six-year-old children. <laughs> yes, that's exactly how <laughs> um, I felt. A bit crazy and noisy and energetic and some. And at some point, your cat, your six-month-old child, will develop into a dog, a six-year-old child. And the thing is, it happens kind of imperceptibly, so it kind of creeps up on you. It's like boiling a frog, you know. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> so gradually raise the temperature. I'm not in the habit of boiling frogs, but that's you know a commonly used <laughs> analogy. And so at some point you kind of come to tolerate things that you might not have tolerated pre-children. This is one of those annoying things that parents always say. And people without children are always like, nah, 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 that doesn't apply to me. (laughs) I'm clinging on to that idea. I really hope that's the case because I think my current state of slightly highly strung, don't touch the things, is not conducive to being a (laughs) relaxed mother at all. I thought, actually, in this episode, I'm thinking about myself as a conservator and as a parent, and I am both of those things. And actually, I thought, what do my children know about what I do at work and about my job? So I thought the only way to find out was to interview them. So what's your name and how old are you? My name is Harriet. I am five. Alexander, and I am seven years old. And do you know what I do for a job? Mm, no. Where do I work? Um, the museum. You work at the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. I do. And do you know what I do there? No. Do you know what my job is called? Mm, no. I'm a conservator. Conservator. Mm. Mummy's a conservator. Have you ever heard of that before? Uh, no. Mm. Do you know what that, what I do at work? Mend things, discover Fix things. things. Yeah? What else? Look after them. And why do you think they need looking after? So they don't get broken or damaged. Yeah. What kind of things do you think might damage them? Because... Someone's tread on them, maybe like if they're too old or... Because they're very fragile, maybe somebody touches them or... Mm-hmm. What happens if people touch them? Then they break. Yeah. And how do you think I mend things? Uh, take them to a shop. <laughs> take them to a shop? Yeah. What would the shop do? Fix it. Ah, oh, but I'm the one who has to fix them, not a shop. What do you think you could use to fix objects? Tools. Mm-hmm. I use them special glue. That's right. So, um, I mean, what do you use? What kind of tools do you use? Oh, lots of tools. So, um, lots of special brushes. Yes. And we might use those for painting or... 
very special big soft brushes for dusting things very gently. What do you mean dusting them? Do you mean so, like get the dust off? That's them? right. I thought you meant put dust on. No, I don't want to put dust on the objects. Um, and I use scalpels quite a lot. What are they? Are they kind of like spanners? Not really. They're like special sharp knives that surgeons use in hospitals. But we also use them because they're very useful for cutting things very carefully. Um, special shapes or for cleaning things very, very gently. Um, I use swabs. What are they? They're bits of cotton wool wrapped around a bamboo skewer or around a cocktail stick. And it's a bit like a cotton bud. Yes, yeah, so are those like things that you clean out stuff and that's right not like cleaning out ears but cleaning objects yes. and you can dip the swab so it's just a little bit wet in water or something else yes. and yes. use it to clean we dirt off that. things yes like that yeah um why do you think we need to mend things in the museum um because uh because there might have been like too old or there might have been too many insects and what do you think we need to do with the objects when they're mended? Put them on displays. Yeah. And in the museum, where do you think we put the objects that aren't on display? Maybe just put them... I don't know. They're in special rooms. And they're called stores. Storerooms, yes. Yeah. And what do you think those might look like? They might have, like, a load of cupboards and shelves in them. That's right. They may have a load of boxes and things. Yeah. Why do you think we yes. should put things in boxes? So that they uh, don't get damaged. What yes. might damage them if they're not in a box? They might get dusty. Yes, yeah, say... And they're there for a long time. You were, if you kept, like, an old, um, old chair, antique chair for a long time mm -hmm. and then if you kept it for a long time then it would get too dusty and rusty and everything like that do you think we should keep old things or just get rid of them because they're old keep them why is that so um scientists can look at them and discover them yeah what about you harriet uh keep them why so you can fix them. Yeah. And so you can give them back. To who? To the people who belong, who own them. But what if that, what if the things are really, really old and the people they belong to are all dead? Um. Who do they belong to then? They belong to someone else. Who do you think? Do you think they belong to the museum or not? Yes. Yeah. And you can't give them away. Yeah. Because if you give them away, you won't have anything in your museum. It will be just empty. Mm, and nobody will come and see it. No. So that's why. Uh, what do you think... Where do you think I work in the museum? What's my room like? Yeah, so there might be, like, a load of chairs and tables and then there are maybe, like, some old stuff like teapots and things like that. What are the teapots for? Like, mending, looking at... Oh, I see yeah, things so that I'm in the middle of mending. Yeah, yeah. yeah so... Um, it's got broken stuff in it. Mm -hmm. And... There's tools to fix it, hammers, mm -hmm. things like that. Yep. With glue. That's right. It's like a lab. Who works in a lab? Um, scientists. That's right. Or creators. Yeah. And do you think I need to wear special clothes? When yeah. I'm, what do you think I should wear? Um, you should wear um stuff like. Special goggles mm. and special clothes. What kind of special clothes? Ones with some a jacket, so um you can protect yourself. That's right. Lab coats. Mm. Just like what I wore on Science Day. That's right. What do you think I need to protect myself from? From the dirt. Mm hmm. And. 
also if it's in a lab what else might you have scientist things mm. like chemicals chemicals yeah what else do you think i could wear to protect myself gloves gloves yeah do you know what kind of gloves they might be are they like the woolly gloves you wear in the winter? No, no, that the these gloves gloves will be yellow. Yellow. Okay. Have you seen people wearing yellow gloves before? Well, I've seen them on the TV. Oh, okay. What program was that? Um, I think it was. Oh, yeah, it was Number Jacks. Oh, okay. You wear special gloves, like um, like. The blue gloves that doctors sometimes wear. Yeah, what do you think those are for? Why do I have to wear gloves? So that so that your hands don't get dirty. Mm-hmm. Like if you're uh, using special glues or mm-hmm. things like that, because sometimes it can stain and you can't get it off. Oh, OK, those are like special gloves to protect your hands from chemicals and also to protect the objects from your hands. Why? Because if you touch them too much, you can damage them. We don't want to damage them. No, that's right. So that's why we have to wear special gloves that are made out of rubber. Yeah. They're made out of rubber. Because mm. I know what they feel like. Do you? Have you ever worn them? Mm. Well, no, but... My swimming hat is made out of rubber. Mm, that's right, they feel a bit like your swimming hat, actually. What's the favourite museum you've been to? The railway museum. The one in York? Yes, it was about trains and I found it interesting when we went. Mm. What yes. was your favourite thing there? Quite like looking at the trains going inside them. Mm-hmm. Do you like being able to touch things in a museum? Do you think that helps? Not sure. Sometimes it does, but sometimes it doesn't for me. I need to, like, look closely at things. Yeah. That's a bit difficult sometimes, isn't it, when they're inside a glass case? Yes, like the coffin at the Ely Museum. Yeah, and you can't get right close to it? Yes. So what, what would be helpful for you? If there was, like, a plaque about it so I could actually see what it was really like or... So what, with pictures and yes. information? Or if you could go inside it. What, inside the coffin? I mean, just <laughs> things like that. Yeah. Do you Pause. think you would like to work in a museum? Yeah. Pause. What would you do? Um, I, I would dig up treasure and then put them in special glass case. So, um, and then put them in glass. Mm. No one can touch it. I'll put it in a special in special cover with sellotape and stick it with extra big large sellotape and I'll um, tape it all up until it's all wrapped up. Okay, why would you do that? Because... So, so no one knows what's in there. You and hide things away. Yes, uh, and that's it. I do like the notion that you would take it to a shop. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where that came from, and also my son's um, absolute obs- insistence that we have spanners and hammers and things like that. But I think uh, it was kind of quite eye-opening to me. Are and you surprised? In a way, a kind of reminder that I need to be talking. Yeah, I was, and I, I need to be talking to my children a bit more about what I do at work. And, uh-huh. You know why? Why I'm not always there. So another aspect that might affect, um, or indeed does affect, uh, people affects. who are either trying to get pregnant, are pregnant, or have very small children, is the health and safety angle of things. Mm-hmm. And I suppose I now think about it constantly, which annoys me, because I don't know how long we'll be trying to conceive before we potentially yeah. even have a child. So now it's like, oh God, I'm going to have to be really careful all the time. 
But then I have to check myself and go, were you not careful all the time before? <laughs> yeah. Is that what that means? But anyway, this is great and quite thorough article from 2012, which was in the AIC News, which is called Reproducing Conservators, Health and Safety for Preconception, Pregnancy and Beyond, which is an oddly clinical title. It's a really great title, though. Um, but it's it's actually a really good read. I mean, bearing in mind that it comes at it from uh, a slightly American angle in terms of like the legal stuff. But at the same time, it is a really good read. And I thought I'd just mention a couple of things that are in it. Uh, and I'm going to read this tiny bit out. Beyond birth, certain solvents can transfer to the newborn through breast milk. <gasps> really? Studies have found that specific solvents, including acetone, ethanol, isopropanol, toluene and silane, have been detected in low concentrations in breast milk of exposed mothers. Oh, Jesus. And that's fascinating to yes. me. Like, whoa, what? Bodies are weird. Bodies are super weird. I guess well, that is in a lot of women will still be breastfeeding after they return to work. Yeah. Um, by the time you return to work, your child is probably nine months, a year old, something like that. Um, so you may have stopped breastfeeding. They will have been eating solids for a few months by then. But for a lot of children that age, milk is still a very large part of their diet. And a lot mm -hmm. of women continue to breastfeed way beyond a year. Oh, yeah. And so that is actually an issue for conservators and is definitely something to think about. Recently, um, a member of our collections team became pregnant. And because nobody in the collections team had ever been pregnant, it meant that there was no risk assessment for anything or that nobody had even thought about what might be hazardous in a collection. So I sat down and made not really a formal risk assessment. It was more of an information sheet mm -hmm. where it's like, these are some of the things that we might worry about. And these are some of the tasks that I would prefer that you didn't do during your pregnancy. You, you are still welcome to do them, but I'd prefer if you didn't, mm -hmm. if that's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we just sat down and had like a little chat about the different things and how she felt about it. Because she was like super keen to still carry things that weren't too heavy and like mm. not not be, a, not be a, I think she put it like not be completely useless or anything. Like <laughs> so she was very active, like because we were like taking down exhibitions and, you know, properly doing a lot of work when whilst she was very heavily pregnant. But yes, so she, she stayed quite active, but we did reduce some of her other risks in the collection because we're not very aware of what our collection actually contains so i did the kind of safety first approach of i think these things might contain lead and i think mm -hmm these things are all arsenic uh, and i think these things are all mercury infested or something like i i i can't i can't verify it in any shape way or form and these things are probably radioactive let's just, <laughs> let's just stay away from all of those things because i can't guarantee your safety and you know what your baby is more important than you labeling this object i think the way jenny approached it was a good one um by saying definitely we would rather you didn't do this but we're going to leave it up to you to decide what you feel comfortable with oh yeah because i think a lot of women are terrified when they're pregnant of being sidelined i mean i i in my second pregnancy um we had an administrator who wanted to stop me from ever going up on a kickstool to take a photo mm. and i'm just like you know <laughs> i'm not police I'm that not, <laughs> not completely incapacitated i can climb a kickstool you know without and and i understand she didn't want to take that risk on herself but ultimately it needed to be my mm -hmm. decision i wasn't yeah. being forced into doing anything i didn't want to do but at the same time it is really irritating to feel that you're being held back from things that you could quite rightly do particularly if you're f afraid about how other people are going to view this you know mm -hmm. that you're not not pulling your weight in the team you're being a bit of a drag on things you're not really contributing fully and i think that is something that a lot of women worry about when they're pregnant and also after they've had children this perception that they're somehow less valuable i will say that even for people without children um we live in an aging society and it's increasingly likely that people will have other caring responsibilities even if they yes. don't have children yeah they might find themselves in a situation where they're having to care for their parents yeah as they age yeah absolutely. and so i think employers generally are just going to have to become better at dealing with mm -hmm. people who mm -hmm. have these kind of responsibilities oh, absolutely. and better at being flexible whether that's offering flexible working hours and days or letting people go part-time or do job shares or you know all kinds of things that they can yeah, do yeah absolutely yeah so that's one of the things this idea of um, flexibility is one of the things that i talked to uh, sophie rowe about um, as I said, Sophie and I did a job share for four years. Um, and so we sat down together and kind of talked about our experiences of being parents and conservators. 
So, uh, Sophie, welcome back to The C Word. You've talked to us on a previous episode. Yes, thank you for having me. We're sitting down today to chat because uh, the theme of this episode is being a parent. Uh, I have three, which some people would say was a bit excessive. (laughs) Um, And at the moment, they are aged between uh, 10, which is the youngest, and 15, which is the eldest. So you had your children after becoming a conservator. That's right. So I... uh, I've only actually ever had one child whilst in a job where I had entitlement to statutory <laughs> mat- or an entitlement to any kind of maternity benefits. So um, when my eldest was born, I was working for a, a big institution and I'd been working there for some time. So I was entitled to maternity pay and that was all fine and good. And then, But I left that institution relatively soon after coming back off maternity leave um, and moved abroad for a while. And in fact, my second child was born while we were living abroad. And then uh, the third came along. And so the the second two were born in periods where I was between contracts. So actually I would finish Mm. a contract and then be essentially on maternity leave whilst unemployed and therefore only entitled to statutory maternity pay, which isn't particularly well thought through. (laughs) But it's sort of how things ended up because the family was moving around quite a lot, which we did with um, my husband's job. Did you find it difficult to find work after you wanted to finish your maternity leave and go back to work? I think one of the things that was an issue once I had more than one child was that um, we became quite stuck in one place. You know, by this point, um, it wasn't really feasible for us to move for my work because I don't earn anywhere near as much as my husband (laughs) does. Um, And so by the point we had two children, we were settled um, in a town. And so I just had to find work in that town. Mm. Um, One of the things that I think I hadn't really thought about until I had children was the cost of commuting. So obviously when you have children and you're trying to work in a place that's not where you live and you have to commute, not only do you have to find the money to buy your regular commuting ticket or buy public Mm -hmm. transport or whatever method it is you're using, but you actually also have to pay for somebody to look after your children in that time. And obviously the time when you're commuting is not time when you're earning any money. So that is an additional cost unless you're lucky enough to have grandparents or some other kind of informal arrangement which which works for keeping your children safe when you're not around so that means that not only was I very much tied to the town when I was but I didn't really want to start commute I mean I could in principle commute for about an hour to get to mm. another town where I might be able to get more work opportunities um, but I didn't really think I could afford two extra hours of childcare every single day in order to be able to do that so yeah I was quite limited in that way one way a lot of people get around this is by working part-time. Well, I have very rarely tried to work full-time while I've had my children. And on the very, I did it for about six months recently and it was impossible. It was just impossible. Part of the difficulty was that I normally work 80% time, which for me works really well. It means mm. I have the flexibility to uh, leave work early and collect my children from school or alternatively uh, perhaps have a day off a week and and so there's just enough slack in the system that you can be flexible if you need to take your child to the doctor or in a dental appointments and all that kind of thing it works really well and then an opportunity came to have an extra day a week of work and I was very enthusiastic about it because it was an interesting thing to do and I took it on and I immediately ran into the problem that there was no ability to get uh, after school um, club place for my youngest who still needed one at that point and um, and so I ended up using my annual leave in order to try and collect my child from school <laughs> once or twice a week. And and this obviously is completely unsustainable. So eventually, after a couple of months of this, I went in, in sort of slight state of uh, humility to my employer and said, could I possibly just reduce my hours while this other contract yeah. is on just because I can't manage more than about 90% before it becomes impossible. I should say at this point that um, my husband is just not really able to, to participate in this. Yeah. He's, he, his work means that he just can't get to pick up some things. So that all falls yeah. upon me. And in fact, in our family, we also don't have grandparental support. And particularly when it comes to arranging childcare for either your very young children or even your older children, you can't necessarily do it at the drop of a hat. You generally, you know, if it's good quality childcare, you're very often waiting mm-hmm. for it for some time. And in the meantime, how are you going to deal with the, with the gap, you know? Yeah all of those questions you still got to carry on going you to work certainly do, yeah. <laughs> so um i mean you said that you went to your employer and were able to uh, reduce your hours slightly and you also said that you've been able to use your annual leave to cover it by taking it a couple of hours at a time and so yeah. i mean it sounds as if your employer was willing to be flexible yes like that and actually i've always been really really lucky to have mm. employers who were flexible my experience is so far that my employers have generally been open to being flexible and of course by law they're obliged 
to consider your case, but of course not necessarily obliged to do what you want. It's been my experience actually as well that museums have been willing to be flexible over and above the statutory yeah. requirements. Um, and so I've had cases where they've happily let me swap days so I can go to sports day or something. And of course there are many, many women working in museums. We know that women are overrepresented in yeah. museum careers and possibly particularly in conservation. So, uh, so yes, I think they are pretty well set up for it. It's interesting you should say that because I think there are a lot of women working in museums, but I don't think... Well, firstly, that presupposes that the business of managing domestic life and childcare and all of that kind of messy stuff tends to fall on women and that's why they should be more sympathetic. But also, um, it's my experience, and this is somewhat anecdotal, that there are surprisingly few women with children in museums. Mm. I think the far fewer than there are in the population generally. I have noticed that and I've I've wondered why. Um, of course, you know, it's, you have to be careful not to generalise. I think, you know, the whole decision about having children, why mm. people have or don't have them, it's enormously personal. Um, and it's not always by choice. Sometimes people don't have children because it just didn't happen for yeah. one reason or another. Um, and so it's, it's very hard to generalise. But it, I think it's an interesting observation because it does seem that you're, you're right and that the conservators who you meet are... Yeah, it's curious how few. I, I certainly feel slightly anomalous in being a conservator with children I feel it's something a lot of my colleagues don't have to think about or deal with and and I feel it's not always been advantageous (laughs) no I certainly think it isn't advantageous I mean if you were being completely rational about it and of course it's not a rational decision really but um, there are lots of arguments against it and I think coming back into the workplace when you've had children is difficult and people often and I don't think this is exclusive to museum careers actually I think this I've a lot of friends who have got children have said this they find it that they are because perhaps they are working part-time or there's a perception that they've stepped down a little bit or are soft peddling their careers it's harder to get progression and I ended up just um, I just ended up taking absolutely anything that I mm-hmm. could in order to keep my professional skills going I should say that I became accredited in between my second and my third child but then of course you're under a certain amount of pressure to keep working enough to keep your accreditation going and having you know sweated blood over this thing yeah. I didn't want to lose it and the advantage of course of that is that you you get a lot of experience including in things that I didn't necessarily think that I was going to be doing I mean I did some private work which is something I would otherwise not really have chosen to do which I thought was really really interesting and useful to have a go at and I was very lucky and I mostly wasn't unemployed but I think it was quite difficult to be strategic about my career because I was so limited so it was just a case of doing whatever comes along and now that I'm at the the far side of that very intense period with young children where you you know there's just a lot of juggling I do find myself looking at it and thinking "Hmm, okay so now I have to think more strategically again about how I develop my career and and I'm conscious that some time has gone by and you know I've not necessarily been able to do as much of that as I would have liked. Do you feel your career has taken a hit? Yes, although I have to say I think that it's questionable because, of course, you have to ask yourself, what would I be doing if I hadn't had my children? Would Mm. I still be where I am? And the short answer is I probably could have been more mobile. I could have pursued more prestigious opportunities. I could have pursued better paid opportunities or ones which had progressed me up some sort of ladder. But I think if you look at conservation careers in general, there's actually surprisingly little in the way of progression I do think this is one of the issues in our profession I mean museum careers in general suffer from this but conservation perhaps particularly so there's very often only really two levels you know there's the entry level sort of thing and then there's a senior conservator post and that really not very many other opportunities so in that sense you know what would how much further along or better would I be if I hadn't had my children I'm not really sure and I don't regret them I do love my children I'm delighted (laughs) I have them but you know they it certainly hasn't helped my career having my children at all you talked about doing a bit of private work is that something you've considered doing more actively because I can see that possibly having a private business where you're more at leisure to accept or reject work depending on your own other commitments Yes. It might superficially at least seem quite an attractive option yes. if you have children. Um, I mean, my, interestingly, my experience in private work suggested that financially it didn't make a great deal of difference either way, actually, by the time you think about what your chargeable hours mm. are. And I mean, I was also rather limited in time at that stage. My children were very young. So, yes, I, it's, it's not something that appeals to me um, enormously in the first instance. But now that I am um, probably have some different sorts of experience to what I had when I was doing that, uh, I'm certainly interested in the possibility of freelancing definitely yeah. and certainly you know as a as an adjunct perhaps to you know part-time work somewhere else would you consider 
moving to a job outside conservation if the work sort of dried up locally? I think that's a very interesting question. Um, there, there is a there's quite a big issue about the sustainability of conservation careers. I think that if you're in anything other than a fairly traditional setup, it can be very difficult to make it all run round. I mean, I think that this podcast has focused quite a lot in the past on emerging conservators and how difficult it is to get established. But unfortunately, I think that's a that's a problem that persists through your career and um, and actually, you know, having children just exacerbates it because it puts you back a bit in terms of your flexibility for moving and so on so in other words if you're not in a kind of typical two-parent scenario um, with another earner and maybe somebody earning better than you then it can be very very hard to keep the conservation uh, career going and I am not surprised that I think it's difficult for people and and people leave and this is something you can't foresee I mean relationships break no, down indeed. And, and with the best know, will in the world stuff sometimes happens you yeah, know and, and I, I think if you if you did find yourself with two children and, and no longer with a partner to support you or to <laughs> assist in supporting to have a kind of unit with two incomes yeah you would probably not be able to continue uh, as a conservator I'd be looking for another job yeah like a shot actually. I would yeah definitely you know another aspect of that you know let alone the situation where you might be left on your own with your children is where you might want to have a more flexible approach to who is having parental leave um, so uh, when my second child was born, uh, I was living in Denmark. And Denmark, in my opinion, is like paradise as far as conservators and their conditions is concerned, <laughs> um, because I worked in an institution where, for a start, the wages were all determined on a predetermined scale. So you got paid according to what your qualifications were, what kind of work you did, what extra types of roles you might take on, like union representation and those kinds of things. It's all completely transparent. And the net result is you also get paid quite a lot more than you do in the UK. Um, and so at that time, I think I had almost parity with my husband, who was a junior doctor. And that seemed great. And we were working a similar number of hours. And a lot of my friends were in a position where the dads were deciding to take, they were going to take six months off and look after the children for a while so that they could have well-developed relationships with their children and enjoy watching them grow up and all of that, which is obviously a big part of why you have children in the first place. And we actually also had a fantastic nursery, which was state subsidised. I should say that every penny you earn in Denmark, you pay 40% tax on from the get-go. There's no lower threshold. So you need two salaries to be able to make it run around. Um, But on the other hand, if you need to call on any kind of state support, it's fantastic. So we had full-time childcare for £250 a month with organic food and nappies (laughs) thrown in. It was amazing. So I really enjoyed that um but it made me realize what a difference there is you know in in the way things are here it's very different being a couple without children compared with being a single parent or even in a even in a relationship with children your costs go up dramatically and some of those costs are just because of limitations on your time as you said the hit Mm. that you take because you work part-time rather than full-time yeah and so on and the cost of childcare can be very high I mean I think I remember when we had two children in nursery it was effectively like having another mortgage yeah the amount that we were spending at its worst um I paid over a thousand pounds a month for childcare and that wasn't full-time no and after travel commuting which cost me another hundred pounds a month or so and I was working part-time but I ended up with something like a hundred pounds a month I think some people at that point might be tempted to say, well, why bother? You're only getting, why are you spending all this time to end up with £100? But it's the investment in what yeah. happens once your children are older. And once they start school, of course, then your childcare costs fall dramatically, but they're still there. And school holidays then become yeah. the massive issue that nobody tells you about <laughs> <laughs> when you have babies. Because, of course, then there are 14 weeks a year of holiday to cover and nobody gets that much annual leave. I suppose this is quite a personal question, but I mean, you you were saying about people waiting until they feel more established in their careers before they had children. I mean, did you find that the kind of work you were doing and its stability or or where you were in your career and so on affected those choices much? And do you think there's anything special about conservation there? I think that's a very interesting question because I mean I, I know a lot of people who work in different careers where they've waited until they've reached a certain level of seniority before having their children. I think in conservation there's probably not much benefit in waiting as we've pointed out that you're not going to go up in the salary scales massively. I think it's more a case of whether or not you're entitled to maternity benefit and that's hugely dependent on your situation. If you're on mm. a short term contract then you probably aren't going to be. But I mean, speaking as someone who, you know, I I had my first child when I was 34 Mm. um, and 
I think, did you not do that as well? Are yes, we, are we going to I did. Start? No, 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 People you are did. going to start doing the sums, aren't they? No, no, um, I was 34 and 56. Actually, <laughs> you know, speaking from my perspective now, part of me thinks, oh, it would have been quite good to start a bit sooner because actually yeah. at this stage of my life, I think, oh, you know, I feel old and my children are running around, they're very fast and energetic and I don't feel very fast and energetic. And if there isn't any other particular reason why you need to wait, perhaps, you know, it, it wouldn't have been a bad idea to uh, get going earlier. Oh. I wish I'd had them earlier as well, because since having children, I've become a bit less control freaky about these things and learnt to just embrace the uncertainty and chaos that parenthood yeah. brings. Yeah. And I think I've now got more faith that stuff will work out. Yeah. Um, and that actually, if I'd had a baby earlier on in my career it would have been okay if I'd had a baby in the middle of a contract well it wouldn't have been ideal but I wouldn't have been blacklisted from conservation no. forever and no. so on. and I, and I realise that now and certainly when it came to considering having a second child I, I felt more able to say okay this is what we want to do this is our decision as a family I'm not going to let my concern about work convenience and the convenience of my employer weigh upon me as much as I did the first time. I'm not going to be deliberately inconsiderate, but at the same time, you know, we, we've got to do what we want to do as a family. Yeah. More, I but think. I think that's also a shift that happens once you have got a child. I think yeah. your your priorities do shift fundamentally. And, I, you know, I, I think that's true for huge numbers of people that they suddenly feel having our family and the welfare of the family and having time with this child that we've now mm. had together and all of that takes a priority and it's quite difficult to imagine it actually when before yeah. you have a child a number of things where you say oh yes I'll I'll finish that when the baby's arrived you know and, and you kind of have this blithe idea that once you and I think you have absolutely no idea how it changes you both having the child and actually your desire to do these things that you seemed so all important before the baby came along can be in just thrown off completely I mean, obviously this is personal, but I, I know very few people, you know, are quite as excited about work when their babies mm. are very tiny as they were immediately before the baby was born. Yeah. Um, I think your perspective shifts hugely. And that for that then to continue on when you're making decisions about where you go with your family after that and yeah. you know, how you develop your family, you know, it doesn't surprise me at all that you say that. I think it... But I wish, I wish I'd known that. And I suppose I'm, yeah. I'm putting this out there for but you can't know, can people you? who are younger. <laughs> I suppose not... not not to feel they have to wait for the right time because stuff continues to be kind of messy and unpredictable yeah. anyway. So yeah. it's it's not that you have to do this in the right order at the right time, no. otherwise it won't work out. And because... we're, we're lucky to live in a world where people can have their lives in all sorts of different orders and mm. there's a lot more tolerance for that. I think that the idea that you go into work and you stay in the same job for 40 years and you have your children at a certain time, I think everyone's much more open to all kinds of fluid ways in which you do that. And the other thing I would say, and this is a bit of a cautionary one, is just because you've made the decision doesn't mean things are necessarily going to go straightforwardly. Yeah. And so it's only the beginning of what then can be, for some, great, easy process and for others, quite a rocky ride. So, yeah, I wouldn't put it off for reasons that seem good at the time. <laughs> so I think I've mentioned this before, but my older child um, has quite a serious medical condition that requires considerable hospital treatment or at least has done in the past and continues to do to a lesser extent and is also disabled and that's also profoundly I think affected the way I think about work as well and my I'm still committed to my work and to my career but I also feel that other pull on my attention and my time all the time mm. which I think you have anyway with children but it's just another complication and I have to get used to people feeling they can ring me up all the time at work to have a chat about this and that and to arrange things and so on um, and of course you get that as a parent anyway you you get used to never having periods of uninterrupted time mm. I think um, and I think that can also be difficult in a job like conservation which often requires periods of focus or yeah. um, periods where you know you can devote yourself to something. I mean, I don't know about you, but I always have my phone with me and I'm always dreading <laughs> the time when it rings and I look and it's the school office and I'm thinking, oh, oh. God, which child has fallen over now? <laughs> exactly. Do I really have to go and collect them? But I'm in the middle of yes. doing this fantastically fragile piece of work yeah. that can't possibly be left But your child has a vomiting bug and now needs to be in quarantine for 48 hours. And, yeah, oh, God, there's an exhibition loan going out tomorrow. <laughs> and so... Yeah. Um, I find it hard to maintain the kind of focus I had before I had children. I always feel there's a bit of me that's 
Yeah, I, I, yes, elsewhere. I agree with that. But I actually think I'm also probably more effective at work because as my, my view is I have got a limited time in which I'm at work. And when I'm not at work, I am with my family and therefore I can't just come back to work. I, you know, that's not possible. And so when I'm here, I'm doing it. I'm doing it with 100% of my attention. And because I've been part time, I've been because perhaps it's to do with me as a person, but I feel quite driven to get, you know, things done. And, you know, a sense that I've been productive with the time that I've spent at work. And so I think I've probably, you know, given value as an employee um, since mm-hmm. having children. I really feel a sense of trying not to fritter the time that I have at work away. You know, I don't like days where you feel you haven't done anything useful. Um, I think it can also be quite comforting as well to go to. I mean, I, I find work a bit of a haven, yes. to be honest, sometimes <laughs> right. from the noise and chaos that there is at home. But also... It, it often that's that's one of the few areas where I think okay I can make progress there's a sense of achievement I'm ticking these objects off a list yeah. something's getting done I'm making some kind of difference somewhere yeah um, at home I'm just fighting this rising tide of lego everywhere <laughs> and the place never seems to get tidied up properly and it can be quite satisfying sometimes to have a list of objects to be treated and work your way through them and then at the end think yeah I've done that I've, yeah. I've actually achieved something but also that's you that's your <laughs> adult self and your adult skills and your brain and what you're interested in and committed to and then opportunity to do those things and that's fun because yeah yeah sometimes you end up feeling a bit like a skivvy in your own home don't you yeah yeah so to go back to the part-time thing I don't think I've seen very many explicitly advertised as part-time it's certainly a real minority among the jobs yeah. Yes, I don't see any particular reason why it will change. Mm. I don't think there's any any particular force to suggest that it should change. I mean, one can, of course, apply, you know, for job shares, and you know, some, we did, we did, we did have a job share at one time, and I know you had a job share previously. Before I did that as well. before I had children, in fact, yeah. but that was because we both, um, both of us in the job share, had other part time jobs which weren't really enough to pay the bills. Yes. So, and, and, you know, as we've commented, you know, the museums that we've worked for have been very flexible about letting us change our days around and so on. And perhaps conservation, because it's quite project focused and not necessarily uh, very kind of time orientated, it lends itself to being able to be more flexible in the way that you work. So, you know, I think there's grounds to be optimistic for having a go as pitching as a job share, if, if you think that is what works for you. But I've also, talking to people who are you know writing job descriptions and putting job adverts out there i think their perception is will people want the job if it's only part-time um, i think there's a sector of people who will want the job exactly people like us who've got young children and all you know in conservation or possibly people them. people winding down their careers yeah. who want to start reducing the number of hours at work actually and i wonder if there is going to be a bit of a demographic shift there yeah um, but also perhaps people who want to combine a bit of freelancing with you know the security of having a stable job that you go to mm. for a certain number of hours a week have you kind of run up against negative perceptions about people with children i haven't actually no i haven't personally experienced mm. that I, I did i think when i going back to jobs and obviously as i've mentioned i didn't go back to the same job i got new jobs with children having been on maternity leave for a period i definitely had a sort of imposter syndrome experience mm. where i I went back thinking, blimey, you know, am I, do I still know what to do? And, you know, gosh, if you give me a fragile painted surface, am I going to just destroy it because I've forgotten everything I knew about conservation while I've been having pregnancy brain or whatever? Yeah. So I think, I think I found that difficult, but that was about me and my own, you know, sense of my own professional confidence, I suppose, after uh, maternity leave. But I didn't ever get any negative feedback in the opposite direction from other people. I haven't had that. No, I think I've been very lucky. Mm. Do you feel if you were to look for other jobs, is this something you would try and conceal? What, having children? Yeah. No. But on principle, I don't think you should have to conceal that. I mean, obviously, it's something they can't ask you, but... No. And you are sometimes advised, I think, in these things not not to <laughs> volunteer the information <laughs> Although in case you... you concede some ground there and they go for the childless person who's obviously going to be... Well, I've reached, I've reached around enough age that committed. people probably assume I'm not going to have any more children, so they're not yeah. going to be worrying about that. But I think that uh, also, actually, a lot of um, job applications require you to put in absolutely everything you've been doing, including periods where you That's were not true. at work. And so if they read those, they can figure it out yeah. for themselves. I'm just thinking about, really, about a con- conversation I've had as well with somebody who is an employer who said, bluntly, if they had to choose between 
somebody who had had career breaks or had recently had a career break and somebody who hadn't, they would go for the person who hadn't, no question. And I guess unspoken in that is all other things being equal. But I, I found that quite demoralising in a way. I mean, I can, I can totally see it from their point of view. But having a slightly kind of patchy career and having these sorts of breaks and working part time for a period is kind of inevitable mm. if you have children. Yeah. And I do still think there's a there's an attitude that 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 will somehow diminish your value as a conservator. And, and even if it's just what you were talking about that. I mean, that there is very much a feeling that if you haven't been practicing recently, that, that you're very much at a disadvantage. There are some areas of practice where that would be more of a problem than others. Mm. I mean, I, I know somebody who is a man and uh, and works in uh, a field of conservation. And he says, you know, I never attempt anything difficult when I've been on holiday. I, <laughs> I work for two weeks after I've been on holiday in order to sharpen my skills up again before I'll tackle the really naughty problem. So, you know, and that's obviously, you know, very functioning at a very high level of skill. Um, He's lucky yeah. to have that degree of <laughs> autonomy, I think, yes, is what, yes, <laughs> what strikes but, me there. Yeah. But you don't. You haven't sort of come across this attitude that you're you're not going to be. I mean, I think such a good bet. The, the short answer is, I think I have come across that attitude because a lot of my friends who don't work in conservation report exactly this: that they feel that they are less valued as employees in any field because they've had a break for children, and that somehow that implies less commitment and, well, less capacity perhaps to do a job well. And and this is where you know come back to these questions about why women don't seem to do so well in general and of course you know conservation has a lot of women in it but that's a that's a a kind of cultural problem I think and of course some of it's down to the fact that traditionally men haven't really been taking as much of a hit because they haven't been taking as much time off Mm. and why I would you know personally welcome a more open attitude to men and women being equally involved in you know the parenting and taking time out in order to spend time with their children while they're small and all of that i think the law is gradually making that more possible but there are still lots of reasons why people don't take it up but, and that's clearly there's some preconceptions or some reasons why mm. people don't feel they can do it even though the opportunity exists so i think there is in society a perception that not working every hour that god sends somehow mm. makes you less of a good bet but it's not exclusive to conservation at all. No, and as you said, if, if you're in a relationship, you as a conservator, especially a female conservator, your salary is likely to be lower than that of your partner. Mm-hmm. And so there's already that kind of economic disparity that makes it difficult to share these things equally. It's a kind of structural yeah, exactly. imbalance there, right exactly. from the um, word go. So I don't know if the solution is only to shack up with other conservators <laughs> so that you're both as poorly paid as each other and uh, can be completely <laughs> equitable. <laughs> yes. Oh. That was That's really good. Nice. It's very honest. I like it. I really like especially the bit about the flexibility which you talk about because, you know, I, I think job shares and stuff like that is definitely the way forward Mm -hmm. Mm i I 100 percent think it is i mean for so many reasons like like we were talking about caring responsibilities and all that i think it's 100 percent the way forward i mean i would love a job share with someone i mean Mm. that would be fantastic yeah i'm interested in the um the the problems of childcare, and i'm quite surprised actually given that you know i can't remember the percentage uh, was it twenty one percent of women born in the seventies don't have children? So, yeah, twenty percent, you know, something like that. Twenty percent. So, so eighty percent of women of a certain generation have children. I am, I'm amazed that we're not better at childcare and that we haven't provided that as a society we can't or have not found a solution to providing affordable childcare. So, I think you have some listener stories. Is that right? Yes, that is right. Yeah, so we asked people for anonymous stories that have to do with being a parent in conservation. And uh, very generously, we had a couple of people write in. So here are some of the stories. I found that the industry calls largely for career-focused women, which is great if parenthood is easy and your kids are straightforward. When I returned after having my twins... I'm a twin too, I love it. When I returned after having my twins, I was mainly asked to do computer-based work and lost all of my hands-on work, which was given to more reliable members of staff. I wouldn't (laughs) want to be negative about a career, which I absolutely loved. Being a conservator was my dream job. However, I'm not sure how I'll be able to get back into it after such a long break. My experience may have been down to the lack of co-workers with children. 
other labs may be much more baby slash parent friendly. I'm not keen on the idea of people putting off trying for a baby due to their career. I did and ended up having uh, having to have IVF. However, everyone's career and life are very different. I think some women, women can have it all. I'm not currently working in the field I love, but wouldn't change my decision to be a mum for the world. Fingers crossed I'll find my way back into conservation in the future. Someone else writes, I've got a topic, notifying your employer. I had not considered it before having a kid, but I realized that the moment I was pregnant, I had to tell my employer before uh, I was really through the first trim- trimester and comfortable spreading the news. Basically, I had to tell my boss and close co-workers before I told my close friends. I didn't want to uh, accidentally be exposed to something and there were some riskier tasks, anything with mercury, etc., that I could no longer do. I was also actually really nervous to tell them because because topic two, no one likes when a, uh, when a temporary employee has a baby uh, and conservation is full of temporary employment. I feel like this is a more heated topic and would open a whole can <laughs> of worms, but I just wanted to put it out there. Oh, thanks very much for sharing. So our third write-in, I found my conservation, brackets manual skills, very useful for baking, making general school craft projects. I've helped out in school talking to the kids <laughs> about interesting jobs or historic site trips. On the downside, I had to take it easy on professional trips and conference attendance due to childcare commitments. But this is true for lots of working mums, not just conservators. Uh, Next one says about pregnancy at work. For a female dominant work environment, I was surprised to be told the following when I was asked if a contract I was working on was going to be extended. I never thought I'd say this, but we need someone that can carry things. Not only had this employer and female manager not considered making arrangements that can still put my skills to good use, they actually, in spite of said response, in a very roundabout way, extended my contract indirectly by giving me undocumented work at a lower rate, uh, by so doing attempting to dodge maternity pay as I would otherwise have been entitled to it according to the original contract terms. (gasps) Naughty! Months later, I battled with payroll staff at this prestigious institute, also all female, to prove that actually I had spent the past seven years working there uh, which are entitled me to maternity pay i was then messed about by payroll for several more months and maternity pay finally started to arrive several weeks after my baby's birth hassle that no mother needs to go through and treatment that no hard-working skilled person deserves female managers you can do better <laughs> agreed the future from a personal point of view i'm worried that a career break to have and look after children up to six years in my case will threaten my future job prospects I will never catch up with my peers who will be accredited senior conservators by the time I'm ready to return to work. And this uh, hugely affects my confidence. My partner feels very strongly about this and is puzzled by the lack of family-friendly opportunities in a sector that, in theory, lends itself perfectly to flexible work. Conservation is often project-based and funding-dependent. Uh, Why don't we see that many, if any, opportunities offer flexibility for working mothers or mothers who wish to return to work after a career break? Again, for an industry and a sector that is dominated by women, why, in this day and age, should young female conservatives feel they have to choose between a career and family commitments? In 2018, it shouldn't be so difficult to juggle both and to be successful both at work and at home, uh, either through more flexible short-term contracts, job shares, etc., which would allow mothers to dip in and out of work as it suits their family life. As we were about to become parents, one person said to us, Becoming a parent will sign you up to a never-ending sense of guilt, be it it towards your children or towards everything else that has to be compromised because you have had children. It pains us that that is really true. Are we really destined to feel guilty about family and work because the two can't be balanced? Uh, We absolutely adore our children and wouldn't have done anything differently. My partner always reminds me that uh, that there will be many more years of work left, even after a career break. 30 more years for me at the rate of retirement, uh, (laughs) at the the rate of retirement age is increasing. Mm. Uh, So I mustn't feel pressured. Children only grow up once and far too quickly. And as much as I love conservation, being a parent is by far the most satisfying and rewarding job in the world. As a freelancer, things are a bit different to those working for institutions. One thing it might be useful for people to know is that you can claim maternity allowance if you are self-employed. There's information and a link is provided that we will put in the show notes. Mm -hmm. Working whilst pregnant was tricky for me as I struggled struggled with tiredness for most of my pregnancy. I was luckily in the position that it didn't matter too much if I didn't work much. 
but I can see that this being an issue for some people, especially freelance people. Trying to work on a canoe whilst pregnant was a challenge. Wow, that sounds like a story. <laughs> I had to work from a ladder and sit awkwardly on the bench to reach in, which wasn't ideal, but it was the only way I could get the work done. I did find people very understanding whilst I was pregnant and they were happy for me to work the hours that suited me. Being freelance did make it easier for me to be able to choose my working hours. I don't know how I would have coped if I, wasn't, if I was working full time. Can't say much about working when a mother, as I haven't worked much since the baby arrived. I am hoping being freelance will give me the flexibility to work the hours I want. However, I recently heard that you need to book nursery places well in advance for set days, so this may not work out as I'd hoped. Nursery again. Yeah. Being problematic. Yeah. The next one. Uh, I would say that overall I had a really positive experience during pregnancy working in uh, blank uh, conservation teaching labs. <laughs> uh, I had to be more thoughtful and aware of all the different projects and materials with the potential hazards. But at the end of the day, I also felt that uh, that made me a better and more informed teacher. Due to the labs already having a high safety standard and being more risk aware in some ways, it was business as usual. In other instances where I shouldn't or physically couldn't do tasks, I was very lucky to have great colleagues who were incredibly supportive and didn't mind stepping in. This was in stark contrast to navigating the bureaucratic farce that was taking maternity <laughs> leave from uh, from the employer itself. <laughs> Balancing pregnancy and professionalism would have been a very different experience uh, if I had to be on site in Turkey trying to work, where I have very limited access to PPE and safety equipment. I also have a limited time frame and a small team, so the days are typically quite grueling, uh, not so great for a pregnant woman. Uh, since the baby... Uh, due to the timing of my daughter's arrival, I was unable to head out to do field work this year. Though I was remotely managing the lab through email, it was hard, It was actually a harder transition than I expected to make the switch from researcher to mother. I will go back and continue my work out there next summer, and I feel very fortunate to have field, to have field work that is family friendly. I am also aware, though, I need to make changes to how I spend my time there. This is a transition I have seen several of my female colleagues make beautifully. However, I'm also aware that it's not something that is ever expected or allowed of my male colleagues unless they've made a point of bringing out both their partners and their children. That's an interesting one. Fortunately for my PhD, I'm in the writing up phase. For now, I enjoy the balance of being a, of mum time uh, and with sprinkles of academic time, though I know I will really miss teaching uh, when school begins in a few weeks. Looking forward to the future, I dread fighting with short-term contracts and the instability that is so prevalent in conservation these days, as it's not a sustainable way to have a family, though who knows what the future will bring. Thank you so much to Thank everyone so much. who contributed. We hugely appreciate it, because it's, it's good to hear all these stories, both the sad ones and the happy ones. So thank you so much. Big hugs to all of you. I feel so warmly to these people. It's so nice to feel that you're not alone and that there are other people out there who understand it, particularly when you feel quite isolated as basically the only conservator you know in your vicinity with children. Um, it can feel very isolating. And so I loved hearing those. And Aww. I want to give all these people a hug. <laughs> Aww. Big hugs all around. Yeah, it's good stuff. I was going to say, it's a shame that we haven't specifically talked to any dads, but um, uh, I guess we couldn't find any. <laughs> dads listening, send in your send in, experiences yeah. as well. Yeah, please do. If you're enjoying The C Word and would like to support our work, then please consider becoming one of our patrons. For as little as $1 per month, you can help us keep our episodes online and more of them coming. Patreon helps us meet our regular costs for the show and also to plan ahead so we know roughly how much of a monthly budget we've got. That's super helpful when you're trying to do something special like buy a better microphone or save up to go to a special event. Your support also helps keep us free of advertisements. In return, our supporters get access to our archive of extended episodes, which you can only access on our Patreon page. Yeah, for that $1 a month, you get a little extra audio enjoyment. We've crunched the numbers, and it's about 10% extra content on a regular basis. Well, it's not bad for less than a cup of coffee, eh? If supporting us sounds like something you'd like to do, then head over to patreon.com slash the C word and join our bunch of absolute champions. And this time we would like to welcome Tracy, our latest patron. Welcome to the team, Tracy. Nice to have you on board. Uh, 
And as always, we welcome your comments, questions and corrections. We love hearing from you. So do get in touch if there's anything you'd like to say to us. Thanks for listening. With the C word, and you've been listening to Christina Rosaic, Chloe Rumsey, and me, Jenny Mathiason. Join us next time for an episode about costume. In the meantime, check out our website at theseaword.show, tweet us at the Seaword Podcast, or simply email us on theseawardpodcast at gmail.com. Intro and outro music is Spring by Didi Music, used under a Creative Commons Attribution License. Additional sound effects by Callum Robertson. This has been a Wooden Dice production.